Mark, the second chapter. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. And I'll put it on the screen for those in the building today. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And the King James text today reads, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, meaning carried by four other men. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Do you really need to be there? Amen. I like to use titles that make you think, but you'll get it in a minute. Amen. Do you really need to be there? Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? King Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, King, we love you, Lord. And we thank you, God, for the word of the Lord, for the word of God today is in fact and indeed our bread. It is our sustenance. It is that substance whereby our faith is nourished and grows. Master, we need today as the people of God to hear a word from heaven. We need a word from the Lord. The last thing any church anywhere needs is the doctrine of men or the thoughts of men. We need today a word from God. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint your servant in a mighty, powerful, wonderful way. Lord, I know what you want to say today, and I hope and I ask you to help me to say it that uh, in a manner that is pleasing in your sight and God in a manner that will be received not only in the hearing but in the hearts of those that hear Amen. till up today oh God by the Holy Ghost that stony ground and let that heart today which is hardened by pain that heart today which is hardened by disappointment that heart today God which is hardened by the failure of God's people to act as God's people ought to act let that heart be cultivated and broken up that it might receive today oh God the word of God and that that word might grow and become a great and powerful plant bearing much fruit. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Sometimes those who want to be in the presence of the Lord 
crowd the house, leaving no room for those, listen to me, who need to be in the presence of the Lord. It's often like an ambulance trying to make its way down a crowded street. Many drivers are more interested and more concerned with getting where they're trying to go than they are helping that poor soul in the ambulance to get to a nearby hospital. We need to move over and make room for the ambulance to quickly get past us. But instead, far too many, far too often, stay in their lane and force the ambulance to slow down or even stop in a situation where seconds may very well prove the difference between life and death. Yes, were that our loved one, were that our loved one <laughs> in the emergency vehicle, we'd be screaming for drivers to move to the side and let, uh, make room when we know that the occupant is someone we love and someone we care about, all of a sudden it's important that that ambulance be able to get through. But when we don't know that individual, it seems as though our concern and our care goes out the window. Too many believers have come to church, or excuse me, have come to believe the church exists solely for them. When in reality, the church exists as a vehicle for the propagation of the gospel. Amen. We are there as believers only to have our faith strengthened, supported, and buttressed. But we are there first and foremost to provide the preacher a venue in which he might preach the good news of Jesus Christ for those who yet need to find salvation. What a sad state of affairs when we crowd the sanctuary with our bodies and push away or prevent from entering those who really desperately need to be where they might hear this saving message. Amen. You know, it's awful sad. In our primary text today, we read that the Lord went into a home, and it must have been a fairly large home, and a whole bunch of people gathered together because where the Lord and His people want to be. Got news for you, preacher. Where Jesus is, people still want to be. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If preachers would worry more about preaching Jesus and preaching the cross and preaching Calvary and preaching salvation, and preaching the power of the Holy Ghost and preaching healing and those positive constructive things that make up the gospel of Jesus Christ they might just find that people want to be where the presence of the Lord is yes, the problem with many churches today I know because I visited a number of churches over the last several years it amazes me how few churches today have the presence of God anymore. Mm -hmm. They still talk like they do. Oh, they still act like they do. Tommy and I went to a conference um, some years back up in Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, the meetings, as far as I could tell you, were lifeless and dead and dry. And the preaching was mediocre at best. And yet, you know, they get up day after day. Oh, we just thank the Lord for His great presence and the wonderful move of God that we've been experiencing. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know what move of God you're talking about. But apparently the move of God that I've seen over the years is not the same move of God that you've seen. It reminds me of Jason and when he first came to the Lord and he first received the Holy Ghost, my former partner in, uh, you know, I've told this story before, but it bears repeating. And he kept, uh, we would visit churches in New York City. We lived in New York City. And we would visit various churches in New York City. And we went to some of the biggest named churches, some of the most famous churches that you'd ever want to name. I could tell you the name of them, but I don't want to embarrass them today. We went to one church in Times Square. 
Anybody knows anything about New York City? I just told you the name of the church, Times Square Church. It was started by David Wilkerson. Huge mega church. They took an old, beautiful old uh, Broadway theater and they revitalized. Oh, it's a gorgeous building. The building was just... Uh, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful. They have a huge Broadway stage, and man, I mean, they pull back the curtain, and they got a big choir there. They got all kind of uh, interpreters that are in these little, look like phone booths over on the side, and the interpreter's in there, and he's listening to the service, and then he's interpreting it in a certain language, and visitors from all over the world could grab headsets at the front at the visitor station and if you needed German then you'd get headsets for the guy who was interpreting in German yeah. if you needed Spanish then you got headsets from the guy and there were people all over the sanctuary with different headsets on and during the service the whole thing I mean you talk about impressive it was impressive and during the worship service boy they had a big choir and they had a big band and a big orchestra and they were all dressed pretty and everything would you, you know I mean they're in an old uh, uh, Broadway thing so they might as well make church show business. Come on now. And uh, they put on a good show. And some of the people, you know, kind of doody 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 do during the service, you know. And we come out of the service and Jason was saying to me, oh, that was wonderful. I really liked that. That was great. And you can call me an old poop in the mud if you want to. Doesn't bother me no kind of way. I know what the move of God is. I know what the power of the Holy Ghost is. And I said, Jason, I said, kiddo, one of these days we're going to visit a church and we're going to experience a genuine, genuine outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I said, and you're going to look back at this service and you're going to think, boy, that wasn't nothing. Amen. Holy mackerel, that, I thought that was something. It wasn't nothing. Well, he, you know, was new to apostolic faith. He was new to Pentecost. Then we went to another church in Brooklyn. Yeah. A great big tabernacle in Brooklyn <laughs> that's famous for its choir. Oh, they've got records all over the place. You go to any bookstore, any Christian bookstore in America, and a lot of secular, and you'll find their records, you know, oh, I mean impressive. And boy, they had their service and their choir got up and boy, and again, you know, a lot of show business, a lot of fancy, a lot of frilly, a lot of shiny. That's what people like. That's what people today go to church for. They don't go because Jesus is there anymore. They go because they can be entertained. Well, they had their service, and by God, I'll tell you what, something really happened at their church. They actually had tongues with interpretation. Holy mackerel. Woo! That just blew us away. And Jason come away from that service and he said, Oh, that was wonderful. That was great. That was just amazing. I've never seen anything like that. That was just wonderful. And I said, Yeah, it was all right. So one of these days, Jason, you're going to see God move. You're going to see the Holy Ghost fall like he did at Pentecost. I said, and when that day comes, you're going to look back at this experience and you're going to realize that it ain't nothing. I said, if I seem negative, if I seem down mouth, I said, you know, it's only because I know better. I, I know what God yeah. can do, and this ain't it. Yeah. I know how God can move, and this ain't it. Well, one day I was invited by Brother Montos. He was a Spanish pastor across the street from our outreach center that we had started, our bookstore, our library, and our our coffee shop and brother and sister Montos pastored a Spanish speaking church Pentecostal Trinitarian Church in Brooklyn and they used to come over to our outreach center because we were right across the street from them and they fellowshiped with us all the time and we uh, they were kind of poor people they didn't have a lot of money so we we you know comped them 
coffee and hot cocoa and all that all the time. And they'd come for our uh, Bible study that we did on Tuesday night. We had between 30 and 40 people that came for Bible study every Tuesday night. There were about two or three pastors, the local apostolic churches, that sent their members on in their church bus or in their church van to our Bible study. And one pastor, Brother Bishop Stinney, told me, he said, Brother, he said, I love your teaching, I love your preaching. He said, I, if my people can get to where you are to hear the Word of God, he said, I'm happy to send them. Yeah. And he literally bussed his people to our Bible study during the week. And we had a good crowd for Bible study. Well, anyway, Brother Montos and his wife lived right across the street. And one day... I used to preach for Brother Matos fairly often. Never got a dime. They, they never even took an offering for me. Um, I won't go into that, but some of those churches, that's how they did, you know. And uh, I never made a fuss of it. You know, I preached for him over and over. Every time he invited me, I went right back and preached all over again. I've done that more than I can even begin to tell you over the years. Preach for nothing, that is. Yeah. Well, one day Brother Matos come over, he said, Brother Morrow, he said, we're having, uh, he said, there's a fellowship of seven churches here in New York City. They're all Spanish churches, he said, but they kind of have a little fellowship they've brought together. He said, every month they have a meeting uh, of all the churches and everybody comes together and they have church, then they have a little dinner afterwards. He said, and I told them about you, and they asked me if I would invite you to come speak at this month's fellowship meeting. And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to, thrilled to. So Jason and I rode with brother and sister Matos and their granddaughter to, uh, in their church van to this meeting. I never met any of the pastors. I never preached in any of their churches. I didn't know one soul in the building except for brother and sister Matos and their granddaughter. Mm -hmm. Well, during the course of the service, the pastors, each of the seven pastors from the fellowship got up and introduced themselves and spoke for a minute, you know, just a little brief testimony. And then they'd sit down and they had all of us, the seven preachers and me, sitting on the platform across the back of the platform. And so after they had done all that and they had their worship service and the, everything was in Spanish and I'm saying, Lord, please let them be worshiping you and not Satan because I wouldn't know the difference. You know, I, I don't know what they're saying, but, you know, I'm sitting there clapping and, you know, kind of going along, but I have no clue what the words they're saying and, you know, I don't know Spanish. And then finally the host pastor introduces me and I get up to preach and I start preaching and the Lord had given me a word and really it was a word about faith and believing God and receiving from the Lord. See when I preach evangelistically I preach what God gives me for that church and the Lord gives me words for churches and I, if I have a nickel for every time the pastor or the people come to me afterwards and said man you can't even know how much on the money that message was mm -hmm. I'd be wealthy yeah. but the Lord had given me a message on faith and believe in God and you know and I'm preaching and all of a sudden, I, I don't know why, but I went off on this little caveat, a little tangent on tithing and supporting the pastor and how God ordained that they which preach the gospel are to live of the gospel. God does not want his ministers working secularly. Right. You may want that because you're too darn uh, faithless to give God the first part of your uh, fruit. That may be what you want, but that's not what the Word of God wants. That's Amen. not what God wants. The Word of God said, God ordained Amen. that they which preach the gospel are to live of the gospel. And I don't know why I went on this tangent. I have no clue, but the anointing just kind of drove me in that direction. 
Well, anyway, then I got off that tangent. I got back in my vein, and I'm preaching, and all of a sudden, while I'm preaching, the Spirit of the Lord fell like rain in that building. People begin to stand up. People begin to get up and raise their hands toward heaven. And I mean to tell you, the Holy Ghost started to fall, and all of a sudden, people were shouting, and people were leaping, and yes. people were yeah. running, and people were dancing. And I mean, the Spirit of the Lord was moving, and I was done with my message. <laughs> And the Spirit's moving, and I'm done. I'm finished. I felt wrung out like a rag. Sometimes when the anointing gets on you that way, yeah. oh my God, I mean, it just wrings you out. You have no strength left in your body. Yeah. So when I was finished, I turned to the host pastor, and I said, Preacher, take your pulpit. He he, come back in the pulpit. He stood there, and he just wept and wept and wept. He couldn't say anything. And I sat down in my seat where I was sitting before the I was up to preach, and I preached that day without an interpreter. They said I'd be able to preach without an interpreter. That The people said they'd understand. Oh, okay. Long story short, I'm going to try to keep it brief. I'm not going to go into all the story because it, it doesn't apply to what I'm trying to get at today. Yeah. But long story short, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me three different times to go out in the congregation and anoint three people each time with oil and lay hands on them. And I did. And each time, every time, those of you that listened to that ordination service online, you heard Jason, my former partner, talking about this experience. And I went and I laid hands on the first person, anointed them with oil, laid hands, and they just literally felt straight down to the floor. The building was packed. There wasn't room hardly to do a whole lot of anything. Now, mind you, people are shouting, we're already having church. Yeah. But I get up and I lay hands on one person, boom, down the floor they go. Go to the next person that the Lord showed me, and boom, down the floor they go. I go to the third person, boom, down the floor they go. I go back to my seat, I sit down. I said, okay, Lord, I'm tired. I'm finished. I'm done. <laughs> He, he said, no, you're not. He said, there's three more. <laughs> and he literally pointed out three people. He said, I want you to go lay hands on that one, that one, and that one. I said, okay, Lord. Took my anointed all. I went. I anointed and laid hands, and boom, down the floor they went. Went to the second one. Boom, down the floor they went. Went to the third one. Boom, down the floor they went. Went back to my chair. I said, okay, Lord, now surely I'm done now. Now the church is on fire. I mean, hey, the Spirit of God is sweeping through that place like, <laughs> like a river. We, yeah. I can't even describe it. It was just the most incredible. That place, folks were shouting from one end to the other. We were just having church every which way but upside down. Yeah. And I sit down the second time. The Lord said, no, nope, three more. So I get up and I go to the first one, boom, down the floor they go. Go to the second one, boom, down the floor they go. Go to the third one. And as I get ready to lay hands, this woman looks at me and the voice of the demon speaks through her and says, Don't you touch me. And then she turned her back to me like this. And I just reached around the back of her head and I grabbed, I had the, the oil on my finger, I grabbed her by the forehead and I pulled her forehead up against my shoulder and I said, you one clean spirit in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman! Amen. Boom, down on the floor she went. The church exploded. Holy mackerel. Wow. I went back to my seat. The pastor stood there for the better part of 45 minutes weeping. Never said a word. Yeah. Finally, when he started to speak, you know, he's speaking through tears. He's talking. Blah, blah, blah. After a while, he, he asked a question. A bunch of people raised their hands. Then he turns around as, as the spirit is just starting to wane. You know, things are calming down a little bit. Yeah. He, he turns to me and he said, Brother, he said, I know today we've had a prophet of God in the midst of us. He said, I don't know you, you don't know me, you don't even know anything about our church. Yep. He said, but brother, you came in today and you delivered a word from God to our ears. He said, my wife and I were prepared tomorrow, because that was on a Saturday. He said, we were prepared tomorrow to offer our resignation. We were going to leave our church because we've been working ourselves to death, paying all the bills. People are not supporting the pastor. They're not tithing. If we're going to have church, it's all on my wife and I. Yeah. He said, and we're tired. And we were planning on going back to uh, 
uh, Puerto Rico, he said, and, and we were going to go back to Puerto Rico and we were going to have church in Puerto Rico. He said, but my God, you came in today and you preached exactly what my church. He said, I don't know about the six. I know about my church. Yeah. He said, you preached exactly what my people needed to hear. Yeah. He said, I have never in my life seen the Spirit of God move like I just saw the Spirit of God yeah. move. And he kept telling me that after the service during the yeah. fellowship dinner. Yeah. He, over and over, he said, I've never seen anything yeah. like this in my life. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've never yeah. seen anything. And I felt bad for him because I have and I have many times. Yes. Amen. But see, that's the difference between somebody that knows what the move of God looks like yeah. and somebody that doesn't. And uh, he said, you anointed nine people with oil and laid hands on them today. He said, there are seven churches in this building. He said, every one of the nine people you laid hands on were members of my church. Wow. wow. Every one of them were members of my church. Uh, that ain't God what is. I, I don't know how I don't know how anybody could could luck into that. I don't yeah. know how you Amen. could just happenstance that. Yeah. He said, I asked the people, I said, You've heard from God today, haven't you? They said, We sure have. He said, How many of y'all are ready to start tithing and supporting the church so that my wife and I don't have to pay all the bills to keep it going? And all those hands you saw go up were people from my church who yeah. raised their hands. He said, We're not leaving our church, we're staying. Yes, thank you, Jesus. What are you talking about, Pastor Charles? How wonderful you are? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the difference between the move of God and crapola. Yeah. I'm talking about the difference between a word from God. Amen. And a pretty Amen. little sermon. Amen. See, anybody could have got up and preached something that everybody would have liked okay. Right. Amen. That's not what God sent me there to do. No, if you read our primary text today, you find out the first thing that attracted people to this house is Jesus was there. That's mm -hmm. right. Amen. But you'll also notice the Word of God said that while when the people got there and they filled the place up to overflowing, so much so that there were people even gathered outside the door and you couldn't even get in, the Word of God tells us Jesus preached the Word. Hallelujah. Right. Oh, I want to tell you, there are a lot of churches is today full of people but they're not hearing the word. The reason they're not experiencing the move of God, the reason they're not experiencing the Holy Ghost outpouring is because what they're hearing is from the word of God but it is not a word from God. Amen. That's right. Amen. A word from God. I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be fitly spoken. Amen. It's going to fit the occasion. I remember the first time Sister Cynthia from Austin came to visit us. She'd been following our ministry online for a while, and she fell in love with our church. And the first time she had a chance to come visit our church, we were meeting over here at the Super 8 Motel meeting room. And she came in and she brought a friend. You remember that black lady she brought? I can't remember the lady's name. But she brought her friend. And they sat there. She just was so thrilled. Cynthia was so thrilled to finally be in church with us yeah. after hearing us online, you know. Straight lady. Yeah. Got a husband. And she sat through the service. And boy, she got all excited during the service. And after church, she come to me. She said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. She said, but while we were driving over here today, she said, I went to pick my friend up to come with me. She said, and, and while we were at the house and while we were driving over here, she said, there were like three or four different things that we were talking about that we had questions about, things that we were wondering about. She said, and do you not know you answered every single one of those inquiries today in this service. Amen. She said, I am flabbergasted. She yes. said, I'm blown yes. away. She said, my mind is blown. I can't believe what yes. I've just yes. experienced. She said, it was like God was sitting there listening. And he yep. said, okay, here's the answer. She needs right, right here. Amen. Here it comes. Here it comes. Amen. Here it comes. See, that's a word from God. That's right. It fit the yes. occasion. It fit amen. the audience. The people needed to hear it. Yes, amen. <sighs> The problem is, 
A lot of people crowd into churches, good and bad, dead and alive, full of the Holy Ghost and otherwise. A lot of people fill up the church house as they did in our primary text, not because they needed to be near Jesus, but because they wanted to be near Jesus. Yes, sure, everybody wants to be in the presence of the Lord. If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, you want to be in the presence. I know I do. I do. Yeah. Oh, Lord have mercy. I know I do. I'd be in church every day, all day, if I thought I could be in the presence of the Lord. Oh, I love the presence of God. That's why when Cat Beaton used to come in the church of God, my God have mercy, I wanted to be there for the whole camp meeting. I love the presence of God. I love the power of God. I love to see the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. I want to be where Jesus is. But more than that, I want to hear a word from God. Right. Amen. I don't want to hear a man-made crapple. I don't want to hear a man-made doctrine. I don't want to hear your ideas, Amen. your thoughts, and your opinions. I want to hear a word from God. That's right. Amen. The problem is churches today are full up with people who want to be there. Mm -hmm. But there are people who need to be there who can't get in. Right. Oh, there's a lot of churches, Mom. They don't have room for people that need to be. Oh, no, no, no. You That's look right. too queer. We don't want yeah. you here. That's right. Oh, no, you look too sick. We don't want you. You don't look rich enough. You don't look That's like right. you got yeah. enough money. You're not yeah. wearing pretty enough clothes. No, no, we don't need you here. No, you don't need me here, but I need to be here. If God's here, this is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. If the Word of yeah. God is here, this is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you something, saints. There are believers who need to be in the house of God. There are, there are believers who struggle with their faith. You know, for some people it comes easy. Right. For others, it's a struggle. Yes. I'm going to tell you, life experiences can beat you down and beat you up so bad that even believing God will bless you and even believing the Lord will help you is a struggle sometimes. That's right. Amen. That's How do you know, Pastor? Because I wrestle with it. It's, mm -hmm. Amen. I can look back over my life and see where God has blessed me and 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 helped me and helped me and helped me. Mm -hmm. And yet I'll be in a struggle today. And I mean the enemy will come against my mind and I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy enough and I'm not deserving enough for the Lord to bless me. And I will struggle, won't I, booby? Yeah. He knows because I stand there and yell and holler at him about it. Because I'm wrestling, I'm struggling, I'm fighting that spiritual fight. Yes, amen. Because I just don't, I, I, the enemy will have me questioning. Why in the world would I question? You know, look where he's brought me from. Look at the things he's done for me. My yes, God, amen. why would I question? I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of us, us in the church who need to be in the presence of the Lord every chance we can get. There's a lot of us in the church who need to hear the Word of God every opportunity we can get. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And our faith goes up and down. It ebbs and tides, you know. It just rolls like a roller coaster. And we need constantly to be in the house of God because every time you get into the house of God, you hook onto that chain link that pulls you up. I'm Yes, Woo, that pulls you up to the top of the hill. Hallelujah. Right. So you can make it through another valley. That's right. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell That's you. That's right. Amen. I need to be in the house. I don't want to be in church. I need to be in church. I want to be in church because I need to be in Amen. church. Me too. I want to go to the restaurant because I need to eat. Amen. See, there's some people, they go to the restaurant, they're really not that hungry. Then there are those that go and they need to eat. Yes, well, I got news for you. When it comes to the house of God, I'm one of them needy people. I need to eat. I need to hear from God. I need to be in the presence of the Lord. Do you really need to be there? Do you really need to be one of those people crowding that house? You see, in that crowd, the Word of God tells us there were also scribes and Pharisees. These are people who had nothing better to do than find fault with everything Jesus said. They didn't like Him. They didn't believe on Him. They weren't following Him. 
But boy, they love to be where he was so they could find fault. There are people that love to go to Pentecostal meetings or watch Pentecostal things on YouTube just so they can find fault, just so they can criticize, just so they can be negative about things. That's right. But I'm going to tell you, do they really need to be there? No. They're crowding out the road so the ambulance can't get through. The person who really needs to get through. The person who needs to see the Lord. The person who needs to be in the presence of God. The person who needs something from the Lord. They can't get through for all the people in there who don't even believe on the Lord. Got news for you folks. Those of you who've been pushed out of churches and pressed out of churches. You've been ostracized and uh, put off. Got news for you. The people who are doing that aren't even believers themselves. They're just there for all kind of no good reasons. I've been in churches. I've been in churches and I'm telling you, I kid you not when I say what I'm about to say. One church in East Texas I was part of for a while. That church had demoniacs in the pew. Demoniacs. These people were motivated and filled with demons, and they wanted them. They didn't want to get rid of them. They liked them. They had religious spirits. Yes, amen. I'll tell you, there's nothing more dangerous in the church of the living God than a religious spirit. Amen. A religious spirit, my God, it'll find a way to discourage sincere seekers of truth. It'll find a way to discourage people who really desperately need and want to be in the presence of the Lord. And these people, Mother, they would they would literally push out newcomers, people who newly came to the Lord and said, these people would get on them and just start bearing down on them with all their religion. That's right, amen. I'll tell you a little secret. We had somebody in this church who had a similar spirit and he couldn't get over that spirit. And I knew he couldn't because I he'd come at me with all these stupid things he'd be saying. And I knew. I said, boy, this boy got a religious spirit. He needs to get over that foolishness. Yeah. And then people come into the church and boy, he just want to get upon them. Yeah. And he, when the pastor wasn't preaching, he was trying to preach because see, the pastor wasn't doing a good enough job. The pastor wasn't staying on top of subjects he should have been staying on and riding these people until they felt guilty and until they felt bad and until they fell under uh, uh, the weight of condemnation and guilt. We call it conviction. Oh, Lord, yes. It's not conviction. I'll tell you, a preacher can preach somebody into a state of condemnation and guilt has nothing to do with conviction. That's you just right. convince the person that yeah. what they're doing is wrong. Convince the person that what they're doing is going to put them in hell. Yeah. If somebody sincere enough wants to live for the Lord and make heaven, it don't take a whole lot of convincing. Amen. I could preach back in the day when I was in the holiness movement, I could preach you into hell over chewing gum. Mm-hmm. And I did. Oh, and people stopped chewing gum because of what I preached. Do you really need to be there? There are people crowding the building today and the people who need to be there can't get in. I'm going to tell you something. That this church exists today because the building is crowded with people who want to be there. Yes, amen. But there's no room for people who need to be there. i got news for you. This preacher and my mother and Tommy, we're here today to carry that poor soul amen. who needs to find his way to the presence of God. Amen. We're here today. We've done amen. put forth the effort yes, today Jesus. to tear the amen. roof off the building. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll help you get in there. Hallelujah. Amen. This church is here today yes, because amen. a lot of people will try to keep you out. But glory to God, you've got friends, oh my God, who are trying to find a way to get you in so you can receive from God what you need. Ooh, amen. That's right. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to tell you, I wish to God somebody had dug a hole through the roof for me Yep. when I first come out in 89. I wish somebody had dug a hole through the roof for me and help me find my way into the presence of the Lord. Because yes, I sure couldn't do it for myself. That's right, amen. Oh, but children, today, there are ministries, not just ours, there are other ministries today, 
And we have removed the shingles from the roof. <laughs> so we can lower you by rope. Hallelujah. Because one way or the other, we're going to get you into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Oh my God. In Matthew 23, 11 through 13, Jesus, the Lord said, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, listen, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Oh, there's always those who have no interest in being in the presence of God. Right. It's not that they're not religious. <laughs> you think if you think being religious makes people interested in the presence of God, no, 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 no. No. Tommy's got some family members, some loved ones. They're religious. Got religion coming and going every which way, but upside down, pouring out their ears. Mm -hmm. But you put them somewhere where the presence of God is, and they don't much like it. Mm -hmm. I've been to his grandma's funeral. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I could feel the Holy God. I'd probably ready to jump up and run the aisles. Man, I had to put on my seatbelt. I was feeling God every which way but upside down. I was about to let out a good old Holy Ghost hoop and just start to holler and hop. And I thought, yeah, his mom and dad will just love that. Yeah. They'd never again want me to darken the door of their house if I was ever to pull that stunt. And I'm going to tell you, People in the funeral are feeling the Lord. He's being a comfort to them. He's being an encouragement yes, to them. Amen. He's being a help to them like He promised He would be. And they're feeling the presence of the Lord. And I mean today, I mean to tell you, I'm not kidding. The presence of the Lord was there. Yes, amen. I could feel it in the atmosphere. Amen. The presence of the Lord was there. But there are people there who got all kind of religion. They're not interested in this presence business. Yeah. Amen. Oh, I'll go into a, a religion building that, you know, keeps my doctrine. I'll, I'll go into a structure. I'll get together with people who believe like I do. But bless God, I, these people here, I'm not interested in this. I, th th this is too real. This gets too real for me. Mm -hmm. Had a little girl, a lady I knew years ago, John and Debbie's. Debbie's sister. Yeah. And she invited me. Their family were Russian Orthodox. And they, Easter time came, Resurrection Sunday. And their pastor, their priest, had either died, I think he died, or retired once, something. But they were without a priest. And part of their annual uh, celebration is the night before. Uh, Resurrection Sunday, I, I don't much care for the word Easter, but Resurrection Sunday, they bring the food that they're going to make their meal the next day with to the church in a basket, like the, the uh, lamb is, pop, is uh, one of the things they usually serve, you know, and the potatoes and everything, they put in a big basket, they bring it to the church, and the priest blesses all this. Uh -huh. Well, they didn't have a priest, and they asked me, they they said, you know, you're not of our faith and all, but that's okay, you, you believe, said, would you bless our basket, would you bless yeah. our food? Well, we pray blessing over our food all the time, right. so I didn't have a problem with that, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sprinkle incest, as Archie Bunker would say, incense. I'm not going <laughs> to use incest and incense, incense and holy water and all that, you know, but I'll pray over it, and, you know, and ask the Lord to bless it, certainly. So I did that for them. And I went with them to their mm -hmm. Easter Eve, the, the night prior to. Yeah. And boy, they have a big, their buildings are so ornate and so fancy and so frilly. I mean, the, the paintings on the walls are so ornate and just, I mean, from an artistic standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, they're absolutely outstanding. It's amazing. Yeah. From a spiritual standpoint, 
not a bit of it's necessary so far as I understand the Word of God, but you know, right. from an artistic and from an architectural, absolutely gorgeous. And their service is long and drawn out. And they have a coffin up at the front of the church and they have a thing, a shroud over it with the image of Jesus on it, you know. And the people go up and they bow and they kneel and they put their head down to the floor and they get up and they do it again and they get up and they do it again. They go up to the coffin and they lean over and they kiss his head on the, the shroud. Then they kiss his hands and then they kiss his feet, you know. I mean, boy, you know, talk about religion. Yeah. They have all this. And then, a little before midnight, the people go outside and they follow the priest. And I, their bishop, I think, was filling in because their priest was not, you know, they had no priest. And he leads the congregation around the outside of the building three times. Yeah. Yeah. I was touched by it. I, I'll admit it. I was touched by it to represent the three days. Yeah. And when they first start the service, it's the church is dark. They only have some candles lit. It's very dark, dimly lit, you know. And then we come back into the building following the bishop. All the lights are on. The candles have all been turned off. The coffin is gone. The shroud is gone. Yeah. And the bishop declares, he is risen. Whoa. Yes, amen. And the people respond, He is risen indeed. And he says, He is risen. And the people said, He is risen indeed. And I'm going to tell you, Tommy, I looked at those people. And, you know, I'm not going to be judgmental of these people. I'm not going to sit in judgment of these people. I'm going to tell you, so if I ever saw people believe Jesus died and rose again, these people believe it. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, the joy they express when they say, He is risen indeed. And they said it in Russian and English, you know. And oh my goodness, I'm telling you. And, and there was such a joy and such an expression. And I thought it, the service, you know, I mean, it was religious. It was full of religiosity. It didn't do a whole lot for me except for that last little part. Yeah. But... I had gone to her church, so she decided she'd come to her mind. Yes, I remember. I was doing my internship in the West Haven Church of God in West Haven, Connecticut, under Brother Douglas Carver. And uh, she came to our church one Sunday. And we were sitting there side by side in church where I always sit. And the Spirit of the Lord got to moving. And I mean to tell you, people started shouting. And people started getting happy. And we were singing the songs of Zion. Yes. And you could feel the joy of the Holy Ghost. Yes, and you could feel the liberty. Oh, we didn't have the paintings. We didn't have the architecture. Yes, we didn't amen. have the fancy structure. We didn't have all the gold leaf, you know. We didn't have all the religiosity. Oh, but hallelujah, we had the presence of God. Oh my God. And that girl all of a sudden let out with a wail. <laughs> and fell over onto my lap. She yeah. just cried. Crying. I remember that. Mm -hmm. She told me afterwards, I'm so sorry. She said, I have never felt anything like that in my life. She said, that was the most amazing thing I have. She said, I felt like somebody who was all caged up in a birdcage tightly. And like all of a sudden that birdcage just broke. Yes, amen. She said, I literally just felt like I'd been set free from something. Like I was delivered from something. Amen. Sure you were. You were delivered from that old spirit of religiosity. Yes, amen. See, that's what a religious spirit wants to do is put yes. you in that cage and make Amen. you believe you ain't going to make heaven except you you know, you know, follow every little rule that's and right. regulation and every that's little right. thing because God's grace isn't good enough for you and your faith isn't good enough. And that girl just wailed and wailed Amen. and she come back again and again because there was a freedom and there was a liberty. The Word of God said, Now that Spirit is the Lord. Yes, and Amen. where the Spirit of the Lord is, there Spirit. is liberty. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus said, He who the Son sets free 
is free indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you get in the presence of God. You get in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, honey, religion will be the last thing on your mind. Amen. You get somebody Amen. preaching Amen. the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, the Word of God don't preach religion. The Word of God preaches relationship. That's you right. get into Amen. relationship That's with right. Jesus. Are you going to act religious? You better believe you are if, you, if you're in this relationship right. Yes, amen. If you're in love with somebody, you're going to act married if I tell them the yes. truth. Amen. I don't believe in marriage. I'm not, I don't think marriage really matters, you know. I don't, it's just a paper. It's just something on the wall. Mm -hmm. Is that so? I believe in it. It represents commitment to me. It represents monogamy. It represents, you know, a, a number of the positive things for me. And because I believe in it, i got news for you. Do I act married? You better believe I do. Yes. You hear what I'm Amen. telling you now? Amen. Same thing with people who are spiritual. If they're genuinely spiritual, Marital. Got news for you, honey. You're going to act religious. I had posted something about this on Facebook recently. You know, a lot of people want to argue with you about yeah. it. No, no, religion has no place. Oh, religion has a place. All religion means to me is there are things you do in response to your spirituality that you do with rigid regularity. When you say somebody does something religiously, right. that That's means, right. man, you can count on them doing this no matter what. They're going to do it like this. Am yeah. I telling the truth? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, if your spirituality is real, there's a lot of things you're going to do religiously. There are a lot of right. things you're going to do with rigid regularity. That's People right. are going to be count. They're going to be able to count on you. That's right. They're going to know before they ever ask, they're going to know whether or not you're willing to help. They're going to yeah. know before they ever ask whether or not you're going to be compassionate. Right. They're going to know before they ever ask whether or not you'd be willing to be in the company of this person who may not live the way that you believe or do yeah. things the way you believe they ought to be done. Yeah. But they're going to know this is a religious person. Hello now. They're a spiritual person. They're religious. Their spirituality manifests itself in the way they conduct themselves. Right. And the way they Amen. conduct themselves is with love and with compassion and with generosity and yes. with Amen. charity. Amen. The Lord said, there are some who shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Right. I'll tell you, there are a lot of people in church today who are only there to shut up the kingdom from you and I. Mm -hmm. And when you let somebody get away with that, my friend, then I've got news for you. I'm not trying to be mean, but you're playing the fool. Amen. You're playing the fool. You're letting somebody that ain't even living this thing the way they're supposed to be living things convince you that you don't have a place at the table. <laughs> That's right. Uh, honey, if you ain't living this thing the way you're supposed to be, first of all, if you are living this thing the way you should be living this thing, you're not going to tell anybody they don't have a place at the table, number one. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. For those for whom religion is more important than a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no depth to which they will not sink in their efforts to discourage others from seeking after the Lord. Now, if you want to learn about their religion, <laughs> oh, they'll go way out of their way to help you learn all they can teach. Yeah. But as far as anything substantive, they ain't going to do anything but run interference. Matthew 23, 15, the Word of God said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Mm. Whew. Wow. So I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. Uh, you know, I, those of you who are watching and you know this old preacher, you don't need me to tell you this because you know it's so. I'm going a little long today. I'm going to try to keep it short. Or try to keep it in time. You know I have a bad habit of just saying what needs to be said. At least that's the way I see it. You may see it differently. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Most churches in America today, all they know how to do is proselyte. 
What does proselyte mean? That means to take people from another church or from another spiritual movement or another faith tradition and convince them they need to be part of your group instead of that group. Yes, amen. Most churches spend all their time trying to grow, quote unquote. Right. And their growth is all about how many people can we get who are going to first church to come over here to community church? How many people we know are going over there to second Presbyterian who we can get to come over to our church? How many people are going to first Baptist that we can convince to come to our church? And really it's all about creating a better package and a better program and a better appearance so that people who are going to other churches are going to look your way and say, oh, I like the look of that church better. I think I'd rather go there. Yeah. Let me fill you in on a little secret about Pastor Charles. You wonder why we don't have hundreds of people in the building today. I got news for you. First of all, it ain't because Jesus isn't here. Amen. Amen. Secondly, Amen. it ain't because the Word of God ain't here. Right. Amen. I know that for a fact. Me too. So that means somebody don't care about being in the presence of God and somebody don't care about hearing from God. That's right. Amen. Amen. I know that's not the problem. But I'm going to tell you what. I don't spend my time proselyting. That's right. Amen. I'm not interested in proselyting. If I meet people and they say, oh, well, I go to this and such a church. I say, oh, really? Oh, that's great. Okay. I'm done with it. But do you know who this church is always filled up with? You know, every time we've grown and we've had some new people, some new blood come into this church, you know who they always are? A, they're either people who have told me when I met them or they've contacted me about the church. Uh, but either it's people who say, well, I'm actually looking for a church. Or it's people who say, I don't have nothing to do with church. I used yeah. to go to church. Martin was a Lutheran, had been in the Lutheran church his entire life. I met him when he came to the outreach center to talk to me about uh, doing a presentation concerning uh, pre-planning funerals and what have you. Yeah. And we talked and we began to talk and I talked to him like I always do, people about the Lord and about the Word of God and about uh, Jesus. And as we were talking, he said, you know something? He said, I love listening to you. I like what you're saying. And I like the answers you're given. He said, I'm going to have to check out your church. And he came. And he stayed. Yeah. And then he brought friends. Yeah. Same thing with John and Bill. They weren't going to church anywhere. I could list a whole bunch of people weren't uh, going to church anywhere. That's right. They needed restoration. They needed to be restored. They needed to be reclaimed. That backslider needed to find their way home. That's who we have found. Right. You know why? Because that's who I'm looking for. That's right. You don't see me out there trying to convince people that they need to be in our church. Now, are there people in other churches who might be better served coming to our church? Sure. But you know what my Bible said? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The minute they get hungry enough to ask God where they ought to go, the Lord will direct them here. That's, That's right. right. Amen. I ain't interested in trying to get people to come who aren't hungry enough to want to be here. We must always remember within the church that those who need to be in the presence of the Lord take precedence over those of us who want simply to be there. We should go out of our way to encourage those who need Jesus to enter. And not only those who want Him. Fellow believers like ourselves. Right. Too many believers spend all their time trying to get other believers from other groups, other denominations, and other organizations to join their fellowship rather than finding and inviting those who do not know the Lord at all as we do. Matthew 18, 11, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. In Luke 15 and 4, What man of you, the Lord asks, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? 
In Luke 19, verse 10, again the word of the Lord said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. It is not our job today to find other believers so we can grow our church mm -hmm. right. or our fellowship. It's our job to seek out and find those who are lost so that we might actually grow the kingdom of God. Amen. That's right. Amen. The friends of the man in need in our primary text today found a way to get their friend into the Lord's presence. Sometimes you have to find unique and creative ways to rise above the fray and above the crowds and create an egress whereby the one in need is able to find the Lord. Yes, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. Our church today is exactly that. Hallelujah. Amen. We're a hole in the roof. Glory to God. Amen. The mainstream church don't want us. We said, that's all right. We'll just come in through the roof. Glory. Amen. Amen. While so many in the church world want to exclude and ostracize certain of us because of who we are, where we come from, our life circumstances, Dance, how much money we make, what neighborhood we Amen. live in, what Amen. type of clothes we wear, what kind of car we drive, what kind of house we live in. There are those of us who have simply said, I would not be denied. Amen. That's right. Oh, yeah. hallelujah. We have climbed to the top of the church and removed shingles from the structure until Amen. we've created a hole large enough to lower our needy friends down That's into right. the Amen. presence of the Lord. And once in His presence, we find that He is quick to forgive and to heal. Amen. I'll tell you a little secret. One of the things the Lord illustrated in our primary text today is that healing and forgiveness are married to one another. Yes, amen. When God heals somebody, He has automatically forgiven them. Yes, amen. Say, Pastor, is that scriptural? Most certainly is. James 5, 14 and 15, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. I got news for you, honey. I left the hospital in 2000 not only healed, but I left the hospital in 2000 forgiven. Glory to God. Oh, I want you to know, when God heals, He forgives. Healing is as much the physical evidence of God's forgiveness as talking in tongues is the physical evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. Yes, amen. amen. My Lord, have mercy. Never thought of it that way, did you? <laughs> Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42, my last passage. Now it, come, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus. Mary felt the need yeah. to be near Jesus. Amen. Whereas Martha simply wanted the Lord to grace her home. Yes, amen. Oh, hallelujah. But Mary needed the Word of God. Yep. She needed to be in the presence of the Lord. Yes, amen. Do we today need the presence of the Lord and hunger to receive from His Word? In the end, the question today must be asked, do you really need to be there? Amen. Hallelujah. If you stand with me this afternoon, glory to God.